Okay, well, I'll um, maybe perhaps just start with the uh, the traditional uh, housekeeping announcements um, but before we start the, the interesting stuff. Um, as you may well have seen, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, the recording will be made available uh, on the um, ENCA YouTube channel uh, after, um, uh, after this webinar. Uh, similarly, the presentations that you'll see today will be published on the ENCA website. And anybody that's registered for the, web, uh, for the webinar will receive an email um, next week uh, with the links to all those resources. Uh, we've got um, obviously the Q&A uh, section uh, up and running. So if you've got questions um, to any of the panelists uh, in general or specifically in response to, to their presentations, then please do try and put these into the Q&A section. And then of course, we've got the, the webinar chat running for, for more general uh, chit chat. Hello, welcome. And if you want to share um, some, some case examples or resources from your own um, context, then please do um, pop those into the chat as well. Uh, so from the side of the ENCA Secretariat, uh, hello, welcome. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, but I think that um, pretty much concludes my uh, my formal role in today's proceedings. And actually, I hand over to our president, uh, Douglas Blackstock, who's going to chair today's webinar. Douglas, over to you. Thanks, Anna, and good morning, colleagues. Um, I think we're hitting around 50 people, and uh, I think you've seen more people joining every uh, few minutes. Thank you for, for taking the time to come and join us in this session this morning. And we have a range of input from colleagues um, across Europe, uh, and I'll introduce each one as, as we, we, we go along, um, given their perspectives on, I think, important developments around Level 5 uh, qualifications and programmes. Um, this webinar and the idea came about because I was approached by uh, someone who's well known to my own agency, QA in the UK, um, on behalf of colleagues like uh, Epson Selen and on behalf of Hans and others about how ENCA may be involved in collaboration um, uh, with colleagues who are pursuing work in this area. Um, I come from a, a country that is a very mixed economy. In fact, we even have a group called the Mixed Economy Group delivering across different levels of higher education, where we have universities delivering uh, sub-degree qualifications, we have FE colleges delivering degrees, uh, and a range of new and alternative uh, providers across a very diverse and uh, uh, innovative, in many ways, uh, sector. Um, so it was really interesting for me, but also um, what it just says about ENCA, why the approach to ENCA, I think, was important. We are the umbrella organisation that represents quality assurance agencies across the 47, um, she was 49 uh, countries of the European higher education area. Uh, we're a membership organisation and we have um, over 50 members and we have over 50 affiliates. Um, our members are those agencies that are fully aligned with what is known as the European Standards and Guidelines for Quality Assurance, which is which are signed up by ministers in the Bologna process, the European higher education area, and the others are affiliates, most of them aspire to aligning with the European standards and guidelines. So among some of the things we do, you know, we formed 23 years ago as a network, became an association in 2004. Um, we work to support our members. So uh, we don't sit back and say, well, look at us, we're the elite. We are aligned with ESG. We want to work with others to help support them. So a colleagues from ENCA and I recently hosted a, a seminar, an in-person seminar, with quality agencies from across the Western Balkans and also Central Asia and Eastern Europe who want to align with the ESG. So, so from Bosnia-Herzegovina to Serbia uh, to uh, Albania to Azerbaijan and Ukraine, a uh, whole 13 different countries as they try to raise their systems to a level that meets international accepted good practice. So, so that's one of the things we do. We actually are the main body that coordinates the external evaluations of agencies themselves. Um, we are a very diverse bunch um, who, who elect a board of nine up to 11 people. Nine at the moment, we could be up to 11, uh, through a democratic structure, uh, but with a permanent secretariat based in Brussels for the very obvious reasons of why you base a secretariat for a European organization in Brussels. 
but her members are really, really diverse. For example, I spoke at a recent meeting of the Enoch Narek Network. 12 of Enka's 55 members are Nareks. Uh, we have agencies that only do evaluation at institutional level. We have agencies that only do uh, accreditation at program level. We've got agencies that work across the whole tertiary education space. Uh, and we've got agencies that do enhancement and support and development, as well as quality assurance activities. Of course, all balanced with a conflict of, inter of interest. So as a membership organisation, we have a broad range of interests. And one of the things we always keen to emphasise about the European standards and guidelines, they are not rules of how to conduct quality assurance, but a broad framework which you can operate within. And that may be attractive in this space as well. So it is really important that we, um, as an organisation like ENCA, and, and, and we'll hear more about colleagues from Chain 5 in a minute, we think beyond what is seen as traditional higher education, because that's not the way economies are necessarily going. It's not the way government policies are necessarily going. There is a great demand from employers and from learners about flexible and different approaches to learning. One of the things we've got at the moment is a working group that's just finishing on micro-credentials. We're really interested in how you, you develop models where you can build credit to, 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 to as part of your progress in lifelong learning. Uh, we're also concerned on other issues such as academic integrity and how to ensure qualifications retain their value. So, so I hope that's a sort of helpful introduction to who ENCA is and why we might be interested on that in this in this this, this topic. We've co-organised this with colleagues from Chain 5. I think it's really important. They've been doing a lot of really interesting and leading work on this. Um, uh, I, I, and we want to think about how we can support developments across Europe, how we can work together, how we can collaborate with interested organisations. Collaboration is very much at the core of what ENCA does. Uh, we're mm -hmm. a partner. Um, you know, one of the things we do is we 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 you know, we partner with European Universities Association, the European Students Union, the RASHE in the E4 group. Uh, we work closely with the European Quality Register. We give advice and support to the European Commission. So Chain Five fits in in the idea of us working uh, with others, and we do that beyond Europe as well. So so without any further ado, I, I, so we'll have Hans Dale for a minute from in a minute from Chain Five. And then we've got colleagues from Ireland, Netherlands and Flanders, Estonia and Switzerland. So uh, I think there's a really broad range of different perspectives. I think that's what makes this really interesting for me. And so as we've now hit 58 attendees, it's time to go to the lead act, um, to hand over to Hans Stell, who's going to be our first presenter, uh, which will then follow with uh, a case examples and studies. Please feel... So please, if you can, use the question and answer uh, option yeah. so that we can follow questions and use the chat to say hello, chat to friends, tell us where the weather is, um, make interesting comments. But I, I'll primarily try and follow the, the, the Q&A for, 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 for questions. Uh, and please feel free to put them in there at any time. We'll try and give as many much time as we possibly can to questions from the, the, the audience. Hans, over to you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, and good afternoon, I say New Zealand. It's afternoon, I think. So all over the world. I'm uh, Hans Dahle. I am the, the president of uh, Chain 5. Um, and thanks uh, to uh, Anna and Douglas for having this opportunity to talk about quality assurance, uh, quality assurance in level uh, five areas in, uh, in countries. Um, I keep it short, I hope. And then, because I'm not the expert in quality assurance, so we have, I have a general view, I have a general idea, a general overview of what we are doing as a community of practice of level five as uh, chain five, and then I'll leave it to the experts. So they have the biggest role in this uh, webinar. Um, yes, next slide, please. Um, in short, how about uh, chain five? We are an international community of practice. Um, and we are involved in looking at what's the European qualifications framework, uh, what is happening at level five. We were founded in 2013. So we are celebrating now our 10th anniversary this year uh, after a long, long discussion about who is responsible in Europe or internationally for what's happening in level five areas. 
Or that high education is it vocational education and training or is something else. So after a long discussion, we started in 2010, we said, okay, let's have a very practical community, not political and not having a strategic at issues. Of course, we are hoping to have more influence on that as is a policy, but it's more on the practical side of what is happening at level five in Europe at the European level, but also the national level. We have a lot of members for a lot of countries, and we are really non-profit, uh, a legal entity is a foundation. But um, we always say that our members are paying in time, and, and their investment in time will be that they will learn more from other members, etc. So that's the policy. Next slide, please. Um, what we're we talking about, it's the, the national level five area. Um, that means qualifications at level five with the European qualifications framework, or of course your national qualifications framework. You know, a lot of countries have eight levels, but Ireland, they have more, some countries have less. So you have to connect it to your know, national qualifications framework. And then of course, all those qualifications in some way, um, they use a quality assurance system for that. And that's interesting. That is also what we're talking about in this webinar. But what does it mean if you have a quality assurance system, quality assurance and accreditation, etc.? What does it mean? Who is involved? How are the procedures? How are the standards? So if, how and when, that's what we are looking for. Next slide. So a little bit maybe provocative, but it's an idea. It's about transparency. It's about having an idea what we are meaning if we're talking about level five in a national situation or at the European level. Most of this is about international eh, development. So level five, I mean, is part of tertiary education. Maybe, you know, three and four, one, two, three, four, is secondary education, and then five, six, seven, and eight, we call tertiary education. I know that a lot of people are saying, yes, but it's post-secondary education in the United States and Canada because of post-secondary is old fashioned. Everything after secondary is tertiary. But okay, it's an idea. Of course, it's tradition if you're using post-secondary. We look at three main sectors. We have the higher education sector, we call higher vocational education and training, or higher vocational profession education. Maybe Eric will tell more about that in Switzerland or in Norway and also in Sweden. In a few weeks, they have a conference in Sweden about that. They call it higher vocational education. No training. Training is too much connected to professional and vocational and training, etc. And then business education and training, non-formal, non-degree, in-company, models, units, market credentials, private institutions, business academy, the rest. Next slide. So in European level five area, you know, this some are complaining about that. We have already a European higher education area. Why do we need a European level five area? So it's more complicated, but okay. I said, it's an idea. In higher education, a short cycle of higher education. Adopted in 2018, officially by the ministers to have it as a recognized full standalone cycle. We have not a common international name. That's up to ENQA also, and Eurasia and the European Uni Universities Association. We have bachelor, master, doctorate, a PhD. What, how about a European name or international name? But we are proposing associate. Of course, UK will be against it because they have the foundation degree. But in a lot of countries, they are still now using associate. In higher VPE or higher FET, you, I don't know. There are no common international names. But the question is, do we need them? You know, in Germany, they call it Meister. But Meister looks more as master, but Meister is at level five and six and not at level seven. So it's complicated. And in business education, yeah, it's a qualification linked to level five of the national qualifications framework by a national coordination point. And of course, you have a lot of international qualifications and have a lot of names. I have no degrees, there are no cycles, but they are just qualifications and they can be everything. Can link to professional, about marketing, communication, 
um, finance and control, and private organizations are involved here. Very complicated. Next slide. So if you're looking at those three sectors, you can think about it. You have three quality assurance systems for tertiary education. All of three, they have their own approach and proceed. Higher education, you mentioned already, Douglas, European standards and guidelines. Okay, every country for higher education is now in some way using European standards and guidelines. But for higher vocational education and training, or higher VP, you know, Equafet. I've spoken with the European Commission in Brussels. They have a procedures for that. They have a secretariat. But is it in all countries? Are it accepted? We are there other systems. Do we need other systems? Does the Equafet has to be the standards for vocational education training at also at level five? And for business education training, all kind of standards, you know, also norms like ISO or NEN, uh, they have a lot of diff uh, different standards and everything. So what we are aiming for at chain five and with the help from our experts and our working group, what they have in common, what are similarities, what are differences, what can we do, how to collaborate between countries and national organizations and institutions. Looking at this three sectors. Next slide. So the question is, do we need in every country in Europe, in your national higher education area, a short cycle? I know that there are countries, they are against it. Our neighboring country, Germany, is absolutely against it. They don't want to have a short cycle. Why? That's a different discussion. Based on the same criteria, if there's no short cycle higher education in the national act, do we need level five in vocational education and training and above, and level five in high VP or higher FED? Or is some national government saying, the ministry said, oh, let's be flexible. Do we need both to serve more target groups? What is the next strategy, national strategy? Do you know in the country for the next five years? Next slide. So what we are hoping to do is doing some research. Um, I know that uh, the OSCD, uh, spoken two days ago with someone in the OSCD, is starting also a project about higher vocational education and training. So maybe it can connect it to what we are aiming for. But there's a process within Europe, also looking at the European higher education area. Level five is more and more becoming important. There's more attention for it. So maybe we can have a conference in 2024 about level five, about what's happening in, at level five, in the whole, also work-based learning, you know, work-based learning, internationalization, et cetera, a lot of topics. Next slide. So, and you're the focus will be on the European education area in 2025. You know, the European Commission has said, okay, in the horizon, it will be in 2025. We need a European education area. And there will be a next ministerial meeting in 2024 in the autumn. And maybe we're talking about this topic. Yeah, or maybe one of the issues on the agenda to speak about what it, does it mean? Do we have short cycle? And if not short cycle, what does it mean for level five qualifications in maybe vocational education training? And all countries that have a national qualifications framework now, I think one, maybe one more, but okay. All those countries have now a national qualifications framework. So we can start, and more countries are formulating their strategy. Next slide. So, it's relatively new, but of course challenging. But is most important issue is a format for harmonizing the system, not having the same systems, not having the same, everything has to be the same. You have to look at your target group at the sector. For quality assurance, what is similar? What can we use for collaboration, for a flexible learning pathway and new developments, et cetera, et cetera. So we hope to have our thematic group under the umbrella of uh, Chain 5, we want to have an international working group and then a work webinar. And if you are interested also from the members of ENQA, uh, you're welcome. Next slide. 
Okay, if you want to know more about Chain 5, this is the website. And if you have a lot of questions, you can't you use your question and answers. But if not, the answers are there. Send me, etc., cetera, um, an email. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. Uh, that's a really good and uh, welcome introduction. Um, there are no specific questions yet, but I think they'll start to generate. I think you, you mentioned the Bologna ministerial meeting. I think that's now likely to be in May, I think, Anna. I think that's right in Tirana. Now, Ben, it's a really important thing. And for, for colleagues who are interested in this area, the drafting of the communique has already commenced. Um, so it's really important to think about conversations with your national governments, with your representative yeah. bodies. Everyone will be starting to input into that. And certainly, I think we in ENCA will have a discussion on the board and think about what we might. We will be developing our position statement to put to ministers in time for that event. Um, I, I think now we can move on to some uh, case examples. Um, uh, and, and the first one is from uh, QQI in Ireland, who are a, a, a long standing member of ENCA uh, in both as QQI and in its previous iterations before various organisations were met. I'm really grateful that uh, Brian uh, Maguire has been able to join us. Uh, and Brian has, I think, a lot of experience, not just in Ireland, but around the world in qualifications and quality assurance. So I'm looking forward to some really exciting insights from you, Brian. Over to you. Great, thanks. Can we get the slides up there then, maybe, please? Um, QQI uh, is one of those agencies that, yes, is an ENCLA member, but also ticks a lot of the other boxes that Doug Douglas mentioned in his introduction, being both the Quality Agency for Higher Education, for uh, Vocational Education and Training, or FET, for um, uh, also the NARIC and the National Qualifications Authority. So we have uh, several different angles on, on these um, this question of level five. And um, the first issue, okay, yes, thanks. So, and, and if we move on to the next slide, you see that the first question is, uh, uh, and Hans alluded to this, it's not level five in Ireland, it's level six, because we have a 10 level national qualifications framework. But that's not the only reason I brought up this slide. Uh, this slide is, is illustrating the main qualifications in the framework of the yellow qualifications band, that's the school or second level qualifications. The green band is the further education and training qualifications, and the purple band are the higher education qualifications. And of course, the first thing you see there is that there is an overlap between uh, at level six between higher education and further education and training. So on to the next slide then, that is uh definitely has been the case for over 20 years now um that the when the framework was established it was determined that uh, in terms of um the le learning outcomes for both uh, for qualifications from both sectors which are of course organized by different institutions as well as um uh, it, on the one hand, the universities and higher education institutions. On the other hand, education and training boards responsible for further education and training. Uh, these originally had separate quality assurance agencies and arrangements, but in the last 10 years, they've all come under QQI. So if we go on to the next system, we see the external quality assurance that QQI operates on these uh, at an institutional level for both the further education and training and the higher education providers, public and private. We are uh, we have a, an institutional quality assurance approval and review and monitoring mechanism. At the program level, it's the arrangements are different. So we're an awarding body and we're responsible for the program level quality assurance for all the FET providers, further education providers, and for private higher education providers, but the universities and including the technological sector, where a lot of the uh, technological university sector, where a lot of the level six qualifications are offered, uh, have their own program approval powers. Next level. So in, um, in higher education, each program develops, th there is a, a descriptor from in the national framework that sets the high level uh, generic descriptors. Uh, of the outcomes, but the in each program develops its individual standards, uh, the learning outcomes and is validated. And this is true at, at degree levels, at bachelor's and master's level and doctoral level, but also at um, 
at the level six at the uh, sorry level five uh, the the uh, higher certificate so either and and that's done either by as i say by qqi for the private higher education institutions or the public institutions and these are revalidated uh, every five years in further education and training we've inherited a slightly different model a very different model actually where national fairly detailed standards of the awards were set at a national level under the, what was called the common award system with individual programs developed and shared between providers on a fairly light touch validation basis and these would stay valid until the standards changed the problem with this was that uh, it was like you know painting one of those big bridges by the time you were always running out of um, cover and the stand it was very difficult to keep the standards to have separate standard setting mechanism and a subsequent program approval process uh, for individual providers so we move we have moved in recent years particularly initially in in relation to the expansion of our apprenticeship scheme nationally to a model much closer to the higher education model where individual programs are validated and they're validated through a fairly standard process of uh, self-evaluation followed by a peer review panel either in person or or uh, in, in document and um uh, and then a, a formal approval process with sometimes with conditions so next stage uh, in uh, in total at the moment we have uh, 334 higher educate higher certificate programs and 689 advanced certificate programs so uh, and details of all of these and and uh, details of the the more recent validation reports where you can see how how the standards are interrogated and how the quality delivery arrangements are are um, documented are on our uh, register of qualifications next slide uh, so that's at the at the micro level if you like and i haven't gone into micro credentials having said micro but there, there's a whole other raft of of uh, micro credentials at this level as well but we were uh, after almost 20 years we were we we did the question was raised fairly frequently well are what how did the two qualifications at level six at at EQF level five compare. And so we commissioned some research to uh, carried out actually by the uh, ECTIS, the company that runs the UK ENIC uh, in 2021. This was a documentary analysis of the stated learning outcomes and a statistical learning outcomes, not earning outcomes, apologies for the typo, um, and a set of stakeholder interviews. And the findings from that, the key findings from that are in the next slide which is that both the advanced and higher certificate qualifications are appropriately aligned at level six in terms of the achieved learning outcomes. There is a distribution difference in the distribution of the substrands of learning outcomes between the two uh, awards uh, in, in terms of the program sampled. And a number are comparable and a number are at level uh, seven, uh, that's, uh, that's sorry, at the higher level, and they're more likely to be in the higher certificates than in the advanced certificates. Um, the entry requirements didn't see, signify, identify any significant difference in the education levels either uh, to either set of programs. And they both take about two academic years. Um, but there are different credit systems and therefore the notional learning hours. So uh, the higher certificate uses the ECTS system and the advanced cert uses the old ECVET system, which is roughly half, but uh, there are there are other technical differences between the two. So uh, this is an example of, uh, I suppose, uh, a system where, where we went uh, beyond looking uh, at just the individual elements, the individual programs and providers to look systemically as a, a sort of um, overarching interrogation of what the levels, level five, EQF5 qualifications were delivering in the Irish system. So I'll wrap it up at that, thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, that's really, really helpful. Um, our second speaker is also from an agency, um, Daphne from NVO. NVO, again, is probably one of the most active um, members uh, in, in, in NCA. Uh, and and, and was, although slightly uh, similar to QA in the UK, which operates in four jurisdictions, um, in one bigger country, NVO operates across the Netherlands and Flanders in two different sovereign states. So 
really interesting uh, organisation and always willing to contribute to European uh, development. So I hand over to Daphne to, 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 to hear your case study. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try to share something here. Can everybody see my screen? Uh, we see it, but it's in, uh, if you can put it in presentation mode, that would be great. I hope this should do, I think. But yes, good. So, um, yeah, um, very briefly, um, I'm here to talk to you uh, about the EQF uh, five level programs, of course. Just very briefly going to go into who we are, uh, position them within the Flemish landscape, and then uh, how we actually uh, deal with them from a quality assurance point of view. Um, so first of all, um, NVAO, or NVAO uh, is an independent accreditation body uh, that was established by the Dutch and the Flemish government. So we were both binational as well as international. Um, Today, I'm going to tell you a bit more about the Flanders team uh, that actually focuses on the quality assurance in higher education in Flanders. Um, so our mission basically is that we try to guarantee an insight and justify to confidence in the quality of higher uh, education, but also the quality culture um, of and within the higher education institutions. We have some core values around that. First of all, we try to be involved. That means that the contextualization of the education as well as flexibility uh, within that is important. Uh, we try to be uh, collaborative and appreciative in our uh, approach uh, towards the institutions. And for that, we uh, rely on relation management and uh, trust. Um, then we try to be diligent. Uh, that means, of course, that we try to be uh, critical and we rely on a thorough process um, for the assessments uh, towards a qualitative uh, higher education. And then we're innovative, uh, that's our third core value, uh, which basically means that we're development oriented. We try to be innovative. Uh, we have an attention for the international uh, landscape and uh, standards. Um, just very briefly about Flanders, uh, what we're addressing here today. Uh, so we're about 6.8 million uh, inhabitants in Flanders. There's 35 higher education institutions. Uh, we have around 1,500 programs in higher education, uh, over 275,000 students, just to give you an idea, 21,000 of those uh, plus are associate degree students. Um, trying to go to the next slide. Now about those associate degrees, which are based on an EQF uh, five level in Flanders. Um, I think important uh, to know about them is that they have a specific civil effect. So uh, they base themselves within uh, professionally oriented uh, higher education. They're around 90 to 120 credits, so two year full time programs. Um, they rely very much on workplace based learning, which is also part of the decree in Belgium, uh, which basically means that every program associate degree that is on EQF5 um, has to have one third um, of workplace based learning within the programs. It has a double finality. One is towards the labor market, of course. The other one is to have a salmon tra trajectory, as we would call it in Flanders, towards those uh, bachelor degrees. Of course, it's on EQF level five, which also means FQF level five. That's our uh, Flemish uh, framework. Uh, it completely coincides uh, with the European one. Um, important maybe also to know is um, that the workplace-based learning is very different from an internship in that, that the student will acquire competencies, skills on the work floor within that authentic framework and not um, just apply it. Um, so the competencies learned within the school or the program, I mean, will apply that within an internship on the workplace. Um, it has a highly flexible learning pathways or it should be recognized or characterized by that rather. Um, because it's, um, it is designed or the policy idea behind it, the goal is that it has a wide intake uh, of students. So different profiles, uh, also working students, uh, new students uh, to the system, but also people who are looking to uh, get qualified at a later stage in life. 
Um, now it's a fairly recent story um, in Flanders. Uh, it's only in 2019 that uh, the associate degrees actually uh, made their way into higher education. Uh, originally, they were placed within the adult learning centers. Uh, today, they're always uh, embedded within a university of applied science. That also means that the higher education quality assurance system had to follow up uh, towards 2019. Uh, what happened then was uh, basically initial accreditation assessments of all programs that were reformed into higher education, both to look at the graduation level, that is the EQF5 level, of course, and what we call the domain-specific learning outcomes. These are Flanders-wide uh, learning outcomes uh, that count for all programs in all institutions. Of course, there is individualization uh, possible there within every uh, specific institution. So in 2018-19, um, and up to date, uh, initial accreditation assessments uh, of those associate degrees happened by NVAO. Um, going to continue. We actually have one quality assurance system, one framework uh, that we apply to all levels uh, of higher education. Uh, that is from five to eight. Um, in Flanders, we know a difference between the not recognized institutions uh, who still rely very much on the program, uh, program assessments. Um, but uh, when we talk about EQF5 and especially these associate degrees in higher education, we're actually within the system of recognized uh, higher education. Uh, outside of that, uh, we don't know any at this stage. Um, with regard to our system, um, Important to know is that it's uh, for the recognized uh, institutions that is uh, relies on uh, customized um, program accreditation assessments, uh, customized to their own conduct, as we call it. Uh, briefly, uh, that means that when a new uh, program is initiated, we rely on these initial accreditations. Uh, those accreditations are done, done, redone once. That is, if they are positively evaluated before they resort under the institutional review. Now that institutional review um, looks at how um, a higher education institution actually is, ensures that its educational policy is actually operationalized um, and there um, within the institution. Uh, but it also looks at institu institutional review at the conduct uh, that the uh, university or the University of Applied Science actually um, applies to uh, the quality assurance of their own programs. Uh, so important to know for EQF5, we're at the stage where all initial accreditations have happened at this stage, and we're moving now towards um, the first accreditations um, in the system. Next to that, we also do system-wide analyses in Flanders. These are more topic-based, uh, good practice uh, sharing uh, practices uh, that is included in the quality assurance system. Um, I'm going to skip this for now. Um, what I think is important to know about the quality assurance system is that we really rely on an appreciative approach. Uh, that means that we're going to start uh, by looking uh, at the educational policy of the institution or the program and work, work within that context. Within that context, uh, we actually um, um, try to do a holistic um, assessment uh, what does that actually mean, that appreciative approach within that holistic uh, system assessment? I will go into that in a second. Uh, what that specifically means is that we're going to look towards three coherent questions in every uh, program assessment accreditation uh, to see if the program actually achieves what it says it will achieve um, on a quality assurance basis. So we're not going to look uh, towards uh, a, a policy or a framework that we bring in um, and start from there. We actually start from the policy uh, and the goals that the program itself has. So we're not looking to fit the little blocks. We're rather looking at a ball um, that this program chooses to play its own game with. Do they, in other words, choose the right ball? Uh, the three coherent questions um, are based and underpinned uh, by the ESGs. Um, and they're briefly, uh, what goals does a program have? How do they realize that? That is the second one. And thirdly, how do they actually assess 
um, or make sure uh, that they have realized those goals. Um, that means that we do actually move towards that holistic judgment. That means we look at that whole cake and not at the, the separate ingredients as to how that cake is exactly made. Now, uh, we've done a whole bunch of initial assessment accreditations in 2018, 19, um, and based um, on those 117 accreditation assessments, um, a report was created in 2019 uh, to look at what quality assurance insights uh, NVAO could uh, distill from uh, those practices or those procedures. Um, what came out of that is um, that the further development, of course, of these uh, new programs in higher education on EQF level five would consolidate the quality. Um, that that workplace-based learning uh, that is being talked about, that one third that is also defined by decree, um, that that still needs development, that needs more positioning, more sharpening towards the goals uh, that it is really intended to have. Uh, and that we expect that a shift will happen there um, or that the paradigm will consolidate itself. Um, that stakeholder professionalization is needed. Um, that means all actors involved, both, of course, uh, the education, the educational institutions themselves, but also the work fields. Um, that the reform goals should really be kept in focus. And we're really uh, talking about the flexibility of the programs and the development of that. How is that going to evolve? Um, and what is the audience uh, that actually uh, means the influx of these uh, programs? And then the strong partnerships. So that strong trialogue uh, between the workplace, uh, the institution and uh, the student that is of course needed. Um, I think I said most of what is important. Uh, maybe also important to um, also mention something I forgot earlier is that we actually rely on the uh, intersubjective expertises within our panel. Uh, so we try to uh, combine a set of expertises there, uh, both work field expertise, educational expertise. This is a person who is uh, acquainted with uh, these educational programs at the same level within Flanders, um, an, an international view on that. So international expertise, student expertise, um, and of course, domain specific expertise towards the content of uh, the programs. Um, as I said earlier, we're also active and VAO that is as a whole in Netherlands and Luxembourg. Um, just very briefly, um, because it's not really the focus of this uh, presentation, but in the Netherlands, a similar uh, system is applied. So a same framework for quality assurance for all levels um, actually applies at that program level, at that program accreditation level uh, for uh, all levels, so also for the associate degrees. Uh, and in Luxembourg, um, the, um, the talks that we had in Flanders in the 2010s uh, somewhere um, on the reform uh, of higher education uh, of EQF5, uh, those are going on there. Uh, right now. And then we're talking about the uh, BSTs that were um, or are uh, organized by the DC in uh, Luxembourg. Um, maybe important to know is that the NVAO is also um, assuring the quality of higher education uh, in Luxembourg, Team Flanders, that is. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Daphne. I got confused there. I was trying to operate my mouse and I saw your mouse moving across my screen. Uh, so uh, sorry, colleagues, for the shot. That's really, really interesting. Of course, in the world that we populate, in the world we work in, in quality assurance, the external quality assurance agencies are only part of the answer. It's very key in the European standards and guidelines that internal quality assurance is a principal fact. In fact, I always say the vast majority of quality assurance is conducted by institutions. Indeed, institutions are the real experts in quality assurance, and that's what comes with academic freedom and institutional autonomy. So I guess for the first time, I think we've met, it's Trin Lasseoge. I'm not sure of the pronunciation, Trin, so apologies, um, from the Tallinn School of Economics in Estonia. A really interesting and looking forward to hear uh, an institutional perspective. I see there's some questions coming in, and we'll 
pick them up in, uh, at the end of the contributions. So over to you, Trine. Okay. Hello, everyone. So um, um, I have the good possibility to open the topic, really, from the point of view of an institution. And just a few words, the Tallinn School of Economics is the biggest provider of level five um, in Estonia. And just to understand the Estonian qualification framework, so it was decided in Estonia that uh, level five is not part of uh, higher education area, but is a part of vocational education, which means that we are literally higher wet uh, in Estonia. And so it means that all the quality assessment uh, systems that are applied on us is a, is a, is a part of a quality assessment of VET uh, in general in Estonia. So just a few words, how the system works. So in Estonia, all the, the quality assurance uh, is regulated uh, by the Vocational Education Institutions Act. And... Uh, uh, the quality assurance activities are delegated uh, to Estonian quality um, assessment um, institution, who is also the leading competence center in Estonia in this field. And the objective is uh, the quality assessment of VET so that we can really foster the learning oriented school uh, culture. And uh, when we are talking about uh, vocational um, uh, quality assessment uh, in VET in Estonia, then uh, we can talk about the initial assessment and quality assessment, but the, both are, are study program based and not institutional. So um, let me see. So the initial assessment and reassessment of study program groups in Estonia, the purpose is uh, to grant the right to provide instruction and um, the procedure goes that the schools uh, submit the application to the Minister of Education and Research. And there is a, a council um, consisting mainly on different social partners. And uh, based on the application or report made by the school, the decisions can be, um, th there are three different decisions to give the right uh, without any terms, uh, to give the right for three years, or not to grant the right at all. And if the right is given, then there is, um, without the term, the schools will un undergo, undergo the, uh, the assessment again um, after every six years. And in terms, uh, with terms, um, after every three years. And, uh, and this is applied on initial uh, assessment. If you're talking about quality assessment of vet study program groups, then it uh, focuses on three areas. Uh, the quality assessment is focusing on study programs and the development of programs, also learning and teaching, and everything related to teachers. And uh, the idea of quality assessment is to provide opportunity for the school to get feedback about the quality of teaching and education process, but also it's very much related to the school improvement or school development in general. So the idea is to give recommendations for the school development. And uh, the regular quality assessments are taking place, um, as I mentioned, in every six years. And um, what is important and what is also new for Estonia is that the result of the quality assessment is not linked to the right to provide instruction which means that uh, there might be, um, so to say, um, very critical feedback for some uh, study programs, but it is unlinked with, uh, from the right to provide instruction because uh, the majority of schools are providing uh, studies in very different study groups or study program groups. So if, if there is critical feedback in one group, uh, then it is okay to have very positive in other groups. So uh, the school in general still uh, remains uh, the uh, right to provide instruction. And what is happening in uh, quality assessment in vocation education is uh, different from the quality assessment in higher education in Estonia. Uh, because in higher education, there are also two types of um, assessment. One is institutional and the second is study program based. And uh, institutional ac accreditation is international. Um, uh, also, quality assessment of study program in higher education is international. So the international experts are involved 
unlikely to uh, vocational education because in vocational education all the quality assessment procedures are are made uh, based on uh, national uh, experts so um what is the institutional point of view uh, in this case when we see that we are um, in between vocation education and higher education? There are very many similarities, but we are still assessed on a different uh, basis. So the first uh, feedback I would um, or the first uh, reflection based on the quality assessment that we are experience, uh, experiencing as vocational school, the first is that if we have the all the quality assessment uh, initial and um, quality assessment on study program based, it's based on programs. And the institutional institutions are having very many programs, which means that uh, in the in the school, there is always some kind of quality assessment procedures taking place. And it's very demanding from the school point of view. Um, the second uh, aspect I would like to um, uh, highlight is that uh, all the external quality assessment that is study program based uh, the method or the application form is the same so there are some criteria which are being assessed repeatedly with every uh, assessment for every study program group and uh, from the uh, from the perspective of a school director I can say that the feedback from different uh, evaluators or different assessors actually vary, vary quite a lot. So um, there is a strong um, belief shared by the schools that there should be also institutional accreditation for vocational education in Estonia that would focus on management, leadership, resources, quality culture, serving society, etc. So that uh, right now we are focusing on different um, let's say areas or different criteria, but the criteria should be more similar for VET and, and higher education. And then um, again, um, unlinking uh, quality assessment from right to provide instruction is actually really good because uh, all the schools are taking external assessors as critical friends. And these critical friends are cont contributing into continuous improvement of school. And in a way, it's really healthy way of uh, of taking quality assessment and integrating it into school um, development. And uh, one more thing, and I think I I I strongly believe that we have a, a strong quality culture in Estonia in both vocational education and higher education, and we see that very many schools are using uh, other uh, quality standards or other standards and different uh, quality assessment procedures. And there should be somehow more discussed how we are integrating all those uh, external quality assessment procedures uh, so that the schools don't um, run different procedures, but they should be somehow integrated to have maybe also a more holistic uh, view on, uh, on schools um, activity. And we see that the schools are really as really important the stakeholders are um, are involved uh, into all those improvement uh, processes that are taking place considering quality assessment uh, in Estonia, and we are taking uh, we are we are being um, invited to all those discussions. So we see that based on our experience, our voice is really heard. So we see that, uh, for example, the institutional accreditation for vocational education, it is probably our near future. So, but right now it is something that we are actually missing. So very shortly, that's it about Estonia. And later on, if there are any questions, then um, I would be happy to answer. Thank you. Douglas microphone. Yeah, no, I, I, something happened to my screen. I couldn't find the mic. Um, I, apologies for any noise, by the way. We're getting major renovation work in the house and a kitchen is just currently being delivered while we have this conversation. The trials of home working. Um, thank you very much, Tim. It's really, really interesting. And, 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 and of course, we have a very active uh, member of Enka and Haka, used to be uh, uh, 
uh, and indeed I collaborated with colleagues from the agency in Estonia on a number of projects over the years and we've had board members very, very active uh, in, in, in uh, um, uh, work, um, which takes me on now to uh, it needs an expectation from an institution in Switzerland where we, again, Eric, the first time I think we've met, but of course my predecessor as president of, of, of ENCA was from Switzerland. You can see that uh, uh, ENCA is not dominated by countries in the EU, um, uh, but it's really indeed our vice president from Norway. So, so it's really, really interesting. Again, I, I think a diverse system and uh, looking forward to your perspective from uh, Eric from the Swiss Federal University for vocational education and training. Over to you, Eric. Thank you very much, uh, Douglas. Okay. I hope you can see the presentation. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to uh, share with you some insights um, about uh, the professional education and training in Switzerland. Um, actually, yeah, in Switzerland, we do not really focus on level five, but it's more about uh, yeah, the vocational education and training part. And then we have the professional education and training, which is, uh, you can call it also HIO, VET, and the permeability of the whole system. So my name is Eric. I'm the, the head of the International Affairs of uh, the SUVET, the Swiss Federal University for Vocational Education and Training which is a, a public uh, university. So it's a national experts organization for vocational education and training and under the roof of the Ministry of Education and Economic Affairs, providing the training of teachers and trainers, the pedagogical training, doing research, uh, supporting the business to develop the curricula and also uh, SUVED is active in the international cooperation. So I don't want to go in detail here about the facts and figures of Switzerland, but maybe some key uh, messages, what is important to um, know when it comes also to, uh, to the education part, that uh, Switzerland is a federal state with a confederation and the 26 regional authorities, the cantons, and they also have an important role to play in, in the vocation education and training part. Um, the backbone of the economy are the, the small and medium enterprises. Um, and mainly, actually, when it comes to VET, these are companies with less than, than 10 employees. They have a really strong role here in, in Switzerland. Um, when we talk about the VET, so um, about 90% of vocational education and training in Switzerland is dual. So where the, the training takes mainly place in the company. Of course, Switzerland is a strong tradition in, in vocational education and training. So the first law was established in uh, 1930. Um, and what I also want to emphasize here is that actually the, the business, the companies, the professional associations, they are very strongly involved in vocational education and training, but also uh, on professional education and training, so on a tertiary level. They have the lead in defining the training content. Um, and um, actually, it is then a private, public private partnership when it also comes to the quality, quality uh, insurance. So for each profession, you have a commission which is responsible for um, the development and for the quality, which is led by the business, but where are also um, representatives of the cantons um, uh, uh, to part participate there. So this is the overview of the, the education system in, in Switzerland. Um, so two thirds of, of the young people coming out of compulsory school, they go into vocational education and training here on an upper secondary level, so two thirds, and then um, they can continue on a tertiary level. So you see it here on a tertiary level, we have the classical universities, University of Applied Sciences on the right side. But what is uh, interesting here in Switzerland, we have this higher VET, 
on a tertiary level, which we call PET, so this is the professional education and training part. And uh, we also have the levels then from, from one to eight, according to the European qualification framework. So just to, to share with you a bit more the details here. So when it comes to VET, we have here the two main programs uh, in, in green, which is the federal certificate. It's a two years program. And then the federal diploma of VET, which is a three or four years program. And on a tertiary level, you see it here, the professional education and training part. We have the federal examinations and the colleges of higher education. And um, when we talk about the, the qualification framework, so we talk a lot about the level five, but actually in Switzerland, it's not that, I would say not that big issue because you see it here, or it's in, it's in German, but it's just to give you um, an overview about, uh, about the framework. Um, so level five actually is on the upper secondary level, so which we call initial VET programs, but also then on, on the professional education training part, uh, which is the tertiary level in Switzerland. Um, so here, you, so and you see also that these higher VET programs here, PET, they are a level between five and eight. Yeah, so there are some uh, degrees, some professions which have the same uh, level as the bachelor, master, or even a PhD on, on the academic side. Um, and just maybe to go a little bit more in detail here on this part and on the PET on the tertiary level. Um, in the system you have seen here on the left side, the professional education part. And on the left side, we have uh, the federal examinations. We have two levels there, which are from equal five then to eight, actually. Um, and here, actually, there are only the examinations which are regulated. Yeah, so have there the, the quality level um, and the examinations, they actually are prepared uh, by the business, by the professional associations, and then upgraded it by the Ministry of Education. And the participants are free to prepare to these um, examinations. And you see it here, so with a a diploma on upper secondary level and two years of experience, you can have then access to these um, examinations. And um, yeah, when we talk about quality insurance, so here it's really the task of the business, of the professional associations to define the content and the level of uh, the examinations. And that's also why the competencies of these graduates corresponds very well to the needs of the labor market. And then the second part, actually it's on the same level, you can say here it's uh, EQF six to seven. Um, it leads to the same diploma, but this is uh, more done in the professional education institutions. Uh, so this is more school-based, but of co course also with a, with a practical part. Yeah, what I forgot to say is that on a, um, upper secondary level, so the initial VT programs, we have about 250 professions um, which are regulated, um, which where the content is defined by the professional associations, but um, the, the qualifications um, are accredited and approved by the Ministry of Education. And on a, on a PET level, so on a tertiary level, there are more than 400 um, degrees, 400 professions actually, um, which is yeah, more ma managerial uh, focus or there are more specific uh, degrees linked to the, to the specific profession. So just, um, yeah, and about 40% of the graduates that have uh, done um, VET diploma, so on upper secondary level, 
they continue actually to this uh, professional education and training. So 40%. And here, just uh, to give you uh, an example of the ICT sector, you have here uh, a few professions. Um, for example, your ICT technician, which is a three-year program, which is level four. Um, and then here you have two four years program. You see the different professions here, which is level five. Uh, so here we talk about level five, but on a on an upper secondary level. And here's just uh, in red, so the digital business developer is just a new profession actually, which has been developed by the business and which has been now uh, accredited by by the ministry. And also in within these ICT professions, when we go on the tertiary level, you see here the different um, professions. Um, here on the left side, these federal examinations, which are done by the private sector from level five to level seven. And then the uh, trainings in the colleges of higher education level, level six. Okay, to, to conclude, so um, actually the VET system or the professional education and training is nationwide accredited. So there is this quality insurance there. It is approved by the Ministry of Education. But what is really important to emphasize here in Switzerland is that the content and especially here on PET, the exams, they are developed and managed by the professional associations, so by the business. So they own the curricula and they define the content. And afterwards, it's accredited then by the Ministry of Education. And as said, for the, for the quality assurance, there is for each profession, for each training, there is a commission which is re responsible to ensure this, this uh, quality. And this commission is led by the professional associations and uh, members are from the cantons, uh, from the ministry, and also, of course, then from, from the vocational schools. All right, so uh, this was my presentation, my insights. I think um, Switzerland would be interested also to uh, continue this uh, discussion. As I said, maybe from our perspective, not with focus on level five, but on the whole um, holistic approach. So as I said, in Switzerland, level five is you know, upper secondary level, but also in this professional education and training part, which is has a very, very important role here um, in Switzerland for the labor market. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Eric. And that's a really interesting and positive note to end on. Um, a really, really important set of contributions. And, and some questions have been uh, coming in, which I've answered and Brian answered, but I, I think it's just worth reiterating because I think it's actually important because part of this issue around quality assurance is, is about credibility of qualifications and if you start my starting point has always been the interest of the student or the learner or the trainee uh, that's who we really should be the interest we should be protecting um, and so recognition is a huge issue you know we've been used to Europe with the Lisbon convention but now we've got the UNESCO global convention has been signed by more countries. So I had a question about the, 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 the NARIX and the level of memberships of, of ENCA who are, are NARIX. Of course, yeah, it, 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 it's a more complicated answer than I would possibly have wanted to give. Because if you look at the system we operate in, actually, in my numbers I gave to whoever the, the anonymous question was, uh, we at Q ENCA has 11 members and affiliates in Spain. So the autonomous regions each have their own agency and there's a national agency. Annika. In Germany, we have nine members and affiliates because Germany has the accreditation council, but below that has a competitive market in the program accreditation and institutional accreditation. And Kazakhstan has moved to a competitive market. And then we've a range of countries like Ireland and others who have got a single national organization. So actually, there's probably quite a higher percentage of countries where the um, agency is also the NARIC as well as the 
quality body and Anna's busily trying to find those exact percentage for me. So that's one. But Brian had a couple of specific questions. Um, one about the burden on private providers and one about um, from Helen on the professional quality students, professional body awards. Is there anything further you wanted to say, Brian, on the, uh, the other than what you put in the chat? If not, I can move on to other issues. Well, I think I've covered those and, and maybe more general questions arising from the contrast between the different approaches might be more interesting than yeah. the details of the national system. Yeah. Th th thanks, Brian. I, I think that's really, really helpful because there's a really interesting comment from a former president of NK Achim Hotbach uh, from Austria in, in, in terms of some uh, work he's been doing. Uh, and, and I think it's a really interesting point to... Um, raise in terms of the opportunities, but the challenges and the controversies. And I just wonder if we could start with hands and go around the, the panel in terms of, would, would you think the advantages could be for consistency across uh, the European higher education area? Because that's something that we in Enk are interested in. Um, and actually, are there really practical problems in the way of achieving a uniformity a across that diverse range? And would we be better developing this community of practice idea and developing good practice that can set the example for others. So maybe start with yourself, Hans, and move around the panel and the order we started with. I don't know if Hans heard me or... I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, your question is what, based on the, the, the introductions or the presentations, what really the expectations will be? And uh, what I said, uh, not, not having uh, the same systems. I'm thinking about that. That you mean? We're not hoping to have all harmonizing the systems and the same criteria or et cetera, but it's better to have uh, collaboration between uh, well, the, uh, the agencies or the accreditation body or quality assurance systems in vocational and like in Switzerland eh, and Ireland, they have this, the collaboration. It's about looking what you have in common and then what can you use and etc. And that's what Trian also said in Estonia, eh, the wish to have more discussion about that. Uh, no, my question to you was, what, what are the opportunities if we could try and get a greater level of consistency? Uh, but with it, you know, what are the challenges? And is one solution yeah. to build the collaboration to create the, the if you like, the aspiration for greater uh, consistency? Yeah, well, the, you mean about the challenges if we had started the discussion? So this had some echo on my line. So it's... Uh, uh, it's about the, the, the challenges you are discussing. Yes, what, what yeah. are the challenges then? Yeah, because that was also one of the questions in the chat. It's uh, was what if you're looking at vocational training and training uh, and level five and, and also level six, they have their own system and they have the same, uh, they have other agencies, they have an, an, another ministry or uh, other laws, etc. So the challenge is. Uh, if you're talking about this level five, a national level five area, if you're looking at the underlying systems and the procedures, et cetera, the challenge is to bring all those stakeholders and all those organizations together and have the focus on what do we have in common. The challenge is that I mentioned also, in the, we also um, have it now in the Netherlands, is the big challenge to bring vocational education and training sector and higher education sector together. Um, they are already all, all in the last 20 years, they have developed their own systems. So it's the challenge is to have yeah, a good opportunity, a platform to talk about and to bring them together and said, what do you have in common? What is about flexibility? It's about learning pathways. It's more important for vocational education standard students to higher education or using certificates. So it, that's the challenge. If you if you mean that that that's what the big challenge will be to bring them together to have them the same table uh, to discuss the same issues what they uh, think in the future need to have more flexibility if we're connecting those sectors. Brian, to move over to you in terms of you know, really good interesting point there from Hans about the challenges. 
are, are there opportunities for getting greater consistency? And I see there's also a really interesting question here from Jose from the, the Canary Islands about Eco, Eco, Ecovet. I mean, one, one of the interesting things, Jose, is that um, the European Union is busily trying to develop a European Union quality assurance and recognition framework because they're frustrated at the pace of the implementation of the Bologna process within the EU 27. And getting countries to move is a slow and a cumbersome process and getting everyone to move uniformly. So, so Brian, what, what are the opportunities? What, what, what are the potential benefits of getting greater consistency? Well, I, I think um, Eric's presentation was very interesting because it, it highlighted the fact that the, the there are different institutions involved, not just education and training providers and quality agencies, but uh, the um, uh, employer representative bodies or sectoral representative bodies. One of the opportunities I think that exists at a European level is that some bodies that are not, some sectors, industries, for example, that are not organized in the same way at a, at a national level or don't have the same role at a national level can in fact uh, articulate their expectations of education and training provision at a European level, they have, they have sort of a greater critical mass, and uh, that can in turn inform local uh, local decision making. I know that um, every so often you st there are different arrangements in different countries. The, the UK at one stage had a comprehensive set of sector skills councils, and that's no longer the case. Uh, in Ireland, we don't have a comprehensive set of sectoral bodies. But what we do have is a, uh, ad hoc groupings around, for example, the development of apprenticeships at a national level, where there's a national consortium formed of the representatives of the of the employers and, and indeed trade unions were relevant uh, to um, inform the development of the programs, uh, whether that's at level five or, or at, at other levels. Uh, and I, I do think uh, Eric is onto something there when he talks about that this question of the articulation between the world of work and the quality assurance arrangements is something that's not particular to level five, but that it really is, is very much pointed up by the fact that you have overlapping systems uh, in many countries of qualifications and quality assurance going on at, at this level. And so, so, so the opportunity then is that it, this actually is a catalyst for discussions around how to bring um, either to, to um, introduce new institutions or to compensate for the, the non-existence, if you like, of the, those kinds of representative bodies in, uh, in national or regional systems. Thanks, and that, that, that this is a really important point because it also makes me probably to think of the point in question that Helen asked you. You know, during the pandemic, when I was some chief executive of QA, government asked us to how can we how can we help make sure people get into the professions, uh, particularly when training stopped. And, and in the UK system, we have over one hundred and sixty professional body accreditors in some some with statutory responsibilities, some who are voluntary. Actually, it's a really complex environment to work in, and. And, and they have their own standards and their own approaches and the ways of, of doing things. But there's potentially a, a richness in there in developing a conversation about, um, they, they look at qualifications across a whole range of types and, and areas. I think that is something uh, uh, worth considering. In fact, the point that uh, one of Eric's slides struck me as well in terms of the number of small and medium enterprises in Switzerland you know, the, the, there's five over five million, I think, in companies in the UK that employ less than 50 people. And the vast majority of the workforce in most countries is in small companies. Um, and, 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 and their needs are really, are often ignored in conversations with employers because we, we speak to the big guns. Uh, Daphne, in terms of that conversation about potential opportunities and, 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 and um, benefits of, a greater consistency or, or challenges. Is there anything that came out in that conversation that struck you? Um, well, I agree as with what was just said, of course, that um, if you have overlapping responsibilities and the quality assurance of professional qualifications, um, educational qualifications and so on at the same level, that, that doesn't help you on a national level. But um, I think that's... Um, 
trying to it would be interesting if you if you if we could leave that idea from from that that, that classical audit idea that is under light with a certain set of standards and so on at a European level, of course, you could go and more look at what are the international standards or what is the landscape in which these EQF, EQF uh, level five programs in higher education move. Uh, you could come to a more um, systematic approach of what that quality assurance of, of those programs could mean with, for instance, a specific uh, focus on workplace-based learning and what can that mean and what does that mean in different countries. Um, so to focus more on the, the autonomy and the contextualization of certain programs within certain regions, uh, I think would be more interesting with regard to a more systematic approach of how we look at it within the European higher education area. Thanks, Daphne. That's really, 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 really interesting. It's, it's quite a great segue into Trine and then to Eric afterwards in terms of um, the perspective from institutions on this. What, what, what is it that we could do in, in, in thinking across Europe that would be most beneficial in helping institutions support learners in, in this environment? Exactly. So, Trine, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think um, from the, let's say, like system point of view, uh, there are some aims, but if you're on the player um, on the on the ground uh, as a vocational education provider, then just like Daphne said, uh, there are so many different standards that are actually involved to schools, everyday business, some sustainability standards, for example. And we see that the sustainability uh, aspects are maybe not as strongly represented in this uh, uh, quality assessment systems that we are using right now in these tools, but we are using additional standards just to make ourselves as schools reliable for the, um, let's say, sectors. And I think these um, aspects should be somehow integrated and I think uh, it's a huge challenge for the system uh, as well uh, from the, let's say, state point of view, because if we have schools who are doing already more than, than we expect, they're doing more than that's the minimum as quality assurance uh, that we are expecting. So somehow we should uh, collect the data and really analyze how we can integrate those good practices into uh, the systematic approach. And I think it's a huge uh, resource, actually, because we are doing more on a school level than is uh, the, the minimum uh, requirement. But uh, the question is, are we really interested in these experiences, how we are gathering this information and what we do with this? Uh, thank you, Trent. That's really, really interesting. And and maybe we could then come back to you, Eric, because you've made a, a, a really important commitment to want to carry on the conversation. Um, what, what is it you think that we could do then in terms of practically to, 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 to move forward cooperation across a European level um, to support institutions? Yeah, thank you, Douglas. Um, yeah, maybe before that, uh, but... When it comes to quality assurance, I think you are, you know more than, than me, you are the expert there. Um, but yeah, that depends then also if, if um, how do you define the quality? And if we say that also what Brian said before, um, the one element of quality is that the competencies of the learner then corresponds then to the needs of the labor market. Um, I think then it's also very important or it's crucial that the, the, the business, the professional associations, if they exist, um, they have to be involved in this in this whole process. Um, yeah, and actually just to one, one further thought, um, actually in Switzerland, it's um, already in the, in the definition of the curricula, it's um, the, this kind of quality insurance is already integrated there because there is one curricula for, for the profession and then um, all the stakeholders um, participate there. And then within this curricula, we have this um, division of the vocational schools and the workplace. So everything is actually integrated. So it's a holistic approach. Um, 
yeah so for further steps um don't know i have no re revolution or ideas i just can say that um we talked also about here uh, the ministry uh, of education and as i said maybe the focus is not on level five but i know ministry is very interested also to talk about this uh, we call it your pet uh, the vocational education training on a, on a tertiary level and to have there also a kind of a mutual recognition of these um, of these degrees because this is quite a special thing in in switzerland and i know it's also a challenge to get recognized uh, these uh, degrees in in europe or in in other countries thanks eric I, I i was sitting thinking that we've got another hour in the conversation but i realized that um a voice that may be only 10.27 for me, it's 11.27 for most of you. Um, but so, so Brian, out, and Brian and I are out here on the, 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 the far west, if you like, of, of, of the continent. Um, uh, colleagues, I think that's been a really, really interesting conversation. And that I, I hope it's opened um, some colleagues' eyes to the, the, the variety and developments of thinking. And, and I think that point that Eric just found, I think is the, the, the thing that interested me when Helen Corkel uh, contacted me and then with a conversation with Hans. Um, in the environment I've been working in, um, uh, Wales, so, so there are four countries, just take the UK, there are four countries in the UK, all with different political parties leading, but all moving towards some greater level of integration of tertiary. Wales has created a new tertiary regulator. Scotland is moving, has a joint funding council, but is thinking about the joined up space across, across levels. Uh, of, of higher education, but also higher level qualifications. England is just introducing a bill to create a lifelong learning entitlement um, where you can access learning throughout your life. And, and, and Ireland, I think, Brian, your minister has announced the creation of an integrated tertiary system. And, and, and I see you know, more and more the political conversation is about we cannot just segment and set everything apart as if they operate on their own. There has to be a, a grown-up conversation about how, how this goes forward, how education changes and meets the needs of a new economy. You know, one of the things we'll be talking to our members when we meet in Tbilisi and George in two weeks, how on earth does quality assurance respond to artificial intelligence? Never mind, we also have to think about different types of qualifications and access to, to higher education and higher learning. So I think we've just started the conversation. Uh, I think we as ENCA will go away and reflect with colleagues in, uh, in Chain 5. I, I, we will certainly, all of the slides and presentations from this event will be available publicly. I think there is opportunity for us to perhaps um, in, uh, uh, on, a, we're in, on the website or in a newsletter, get some thinking out there. Um, and, and maybe we'll take away and think about how do we take forward the conversation between those, not just those that are interested in this level of, of work, but also how do we generate the broader conversation, including more people. The fact that we've had, for the first time we've done this, we've had um, nearly 60 people, uh, I think is a good start and, and, and we'll take it forward from there. So I'd like to thank all of the colleagues who have joined, but particularly thank you to Hans, Brian, Daphne, Trine and Eric for you know, it, it, it takes time to prepare presentations. It takes time to put the effort in. And I think we've seen your expertise and your knowledge in, in, in full flight and extremely grateful for, for that. So uh, thank you, everyone, for your attendance. Uh, and with that, I will close the session. And hopefully at some stage, maybe picking up on what Eric said, that maybe sometime in the future, there's a larger in-person event conversation about different types of education where we can play in different conversations and share practice and learn from each other. I do think the important thing is about network. And, and again, Hans mentioned it in his presentation. As we come together in a different network, what you get so much is the sharing experience, sharing practice, learning from each other, learning what's worked and what's not worked and building a community where you can uh, re relate to each other and have greater uh, conversation. And Dee Brian has just um, posted a link to the Centre for Global Higher Education's conference um, from higher to tertiary 
education, democratising post school education. Um, uh, interesting, still got still post school is uh, apparently the link's not working. What we will do when we publish, uh, yeah, the, the one thing about Aurelia, my colleague Aurelia, who I've also worked very closely, she's got an, an eye for the detail. Um, we will make sure that when we publish the slides, we'll promote that conference as well. So thank you everyone very much for the attendance um, and goodbye. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.